Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Bible Breakdown Podcast with your host, Pastor Brandon. Today, 2 Kings chapter 4. And if I were to give this one a title, it would be, What do you do when the worst happens? What do you do when the worst happens? There's going to be some, some great things happening in today's chapter, but also some struggles that I think we got to face together. But before we do that, as always, if you like what we're doing here, make sure you like, share, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Leave us a comment on what's going on in your life and how we are able, how we can connect with you more. Also, leave us a five-star review on the podcast. It really helps us get the word out there. And then, as always, we gather together at the Facebook group discussion, Bible Breakdown discussion. And, man, the more we dig, the more we find. And it's so exciting to see so many of you joining us there. And, man, it is great for us to read and reflect on God's Word together. If you have your Bibles, you want to open up with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. Today is one of those chapters, man, that it is, it's just got everything. It's got beauty. It's got despair. It's got everything in between. And I'm curious if you can identify with something that's going to happen in this chapter today. And that is, what do you do when the worst happens? We've all had bad days. We've all had good days. But there's probably a handful of days that we could really point to and go, those days, those weren't bad. Those were tragic. Those are horrible. You could probably think right now that there's a handful of things that if those things happened, we don't know what to do. Like there's there's some things we can we can manage. But what do you do when the worst thing possible happens? What do you do? Well, we're going to read about that today and see what God's word has to say. Second Kings chapter four, verse one says this. One day, the widow of a member of a group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out. My husband who served you is dead, and now you know how he feared the Lord. But now the creditor has come, threatening to take my two sons as slaves. What can I do to help you, Elisha asked. Tell me what to do and what you have in your house. Nothing at all except this flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, borrow as many jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour the olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it is filled. So they did. She did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing her jars, and she filled them one after another. Soon, every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, Now, sell the olive oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what is left over. First of all, pause. Wow. (laughs) Do you know how frustrated she probably was? Is Imagine this for a moment. (laughs) Imagine that you go and you collect all the jars you can collect, and you go in there and you're pouring this olive oil, and every time you pour, and olive oil obviously was something that you could buy, sell, trade. And so it was, it had a monetary value. And so they're pouring the olive oil, get another container, get another container. And this is what is in my mind. If she's finished, all of the olive oil jars are full. And then after that, a friend comes up and says, hey, did you still need some olive oil jars? I got like 10 of them on my back closet. Oh, you know she wanted to just... In the name of in the name of Jesus, just slap him across the face. You mean to tell me? <laughs> Maybe that didn't happen. I don't know, but I, I can't help but think. You know, she was sitting there going, "Could could there be anything else we could put olive oil in?" Right? But what an amazing miracle! It's amazing to realize that God can use the most bizarre circumstances to get you where He needs you to be, to take care of you in every way. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so, what do you do on the worst day ever? This was a horrible thing for her. She'd lost everything she had. Her husband had died. Someone's about to come take her two kids. And what did she do? She went to the Lord. And the Lord did a miracle. What do you do when the worst happens? You don't do it alone. You take it to the Lord. Now, watch what happens next. This person had lost, before had lost her husband, and someone was threatening to take her sons. Now, what? look what happens in this story. Verse 8. One day, Elisha went down to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, she would stop there, or he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I am sure that this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. 
One day, Elisha returned to Shunem, and he went up to the upper room to rest. He said to the servant Gehazi, Tell the woman from Shunem, I want to speak to her. And when she appeared, Elisha said to Gehazi, Tell her, We appreciate the kind concern that you have shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put a good word in for you to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied, My family takes good care of me. Later, Elisha said to Gehazi, What can we do for her? So Gehazi replied, She doesn't have a son, and her husband is an old man. Call her back again. So Elisha told him, and the woman returned, and Elisha said to her, her as she stood in the doorway, Next year at this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. No, my lord, she cried. Oh, man of God, don't deceive me in getting my hopes up like that. And sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at the time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. One day, when her child was older, he went, up, he went out to help his father, who was working with the harvesters. Suddenly, he cried out, My head hurts! My head hurts! And his father said to the, one of the servants, Carry him home to his mother. And so the servant took him home, and his mother held him in her lap. But about noontime, he died. He carried him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door and left him there. Then she sent a message to her husband. Send one of the servants and a donkey so I can hurry to meet the man of God and then come back. Why go today, he asked. It is neither a new moon nor a Sabbath. But she said, I'll be all right. So she sat on the donkey and said to her servant, hurry, don't slow down unless I tell you. Now pause. A lot's been going on here. First of all, who in the world is this Gehazi guy? <laughs> well, Gehazi was the assistant to Elisha, much the way Elisha was the assistant to Elijah. What a prophet would do is he would take an apprentice, someone that would go and would help him and would serve him and serve his needs and just kind of kind of be his, his assistant in hopes that then he could raise him up to take his place. That's who Gehazi is. Second thing is, is this lady was being very kind to Elisha and helping him. And so Elisha wanted to help her. And so Gehazi reminded him, hey, Elisha, she doesn't have any children. I'm pretty sure that's probably her number one hope and dream is she could have a family. And so Elisha says, you know what? Let's, let's pray and ask God to do that. And God did. Well, as you see what happens, we don't know exactly what was going on, but most scholars think that this, this young man either had a brain aneurysm or he had some form of sunstroke. Either way, that day in her arms, her baby passed away. I can't think of anything more terrible. And then maybe the only two things that would be worse, so, so horrible that her son dies. Here's the second thing. She goes to tell her husband, and her husband only has grief to repay her. Why would you go talk to the man of God? It's not Sunday. <laughs> why, would, why would you turn to God? It's not time for God right now. You know? So no, no faith there. And then how about this one? God took away a miracle that he had given her. That sounds unfair, doesn't it? Now, we could have a, a wonderful debate over the fairness of God and say that, well, really, God gave her this gift to begin with. But you know what I'm trying to say. Emotionally, it's like, God, why would you give me something only to take it away? So just hurt and hurt and hurt. What do you do when the worst thing happens? What do you do when the worst thing happens? What do you do when the worst thing happens and the people who were supposed to support you turn away? What do you do when the worst thing happens, the people who are supposed to support you turn away and you kind of think it's God's fault? <laughs> what do you do? Well, watch what she does. She turns back to God. The Bible says in verse 25, as she approached the man of God at Mount Carmel, Elisha saw her in the distance and he said to Gehazi, remember his assistant, look, the woman from Shunem is coming. Run out to meet her and ask her, is everything all right with you, your husband, and your child? Yes, the woman told Gehazi, everything is fine. Now, that word, it, that everything is fine, is shalom in, um, in Hebrew, which means peace. It means everything is all right, everything will be all right. And so she's saying everything is going to be fine. Verse 27, but when she came to the man of God at the mountain, she fell to the ground before him and caught hold of his feet. Gehazi began to push her away, but the man of God said, no, 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 leave her alone. She is deeply troubled, but the Lord has not told me what it is. And then she said, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? 
And didn't I say, don't deceive me by getting my hopes up? And then Elisha said to Gehazi, the assistant, get ready to travel. Take my staff and go. Don't talk to anyone on the way. Go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. But the boy's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not go home unless you go with me. So Elisha returned with her. Gehazi hurried on ahead and laid the staff on the child's face, but nothing happened. There was no sign of life. But he returned to meet Elisha and told him, the child is still dead. When Elisha arrived, the child was indeed dead, lying there on the prophet's bed. And when he went in alone and he shut the door behind him, he prayed to the Lord. And then he lay down on the child's body, placing his mouth over the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, and his hands on the child's hands. And then he stretched out on him, and the child's body began to grow warm again. Elisha got up, walked back and forth across the room once, and then stretched himself out over the child again. This time the boy sneezed seven times, and then opened his eyes. Seven times in the Bible, by the way, is the number of completion and wholeness. So in other words, it's God's word of telling us God made him completely whole again. Verse 36, then Elisha summoned Gehazi, call the child's mother. And then he said, she came in and Elisha said, take your son. She fell at his feet and bowed before him, overwhelmed with gratitude as she took her son in her arms and carried him downstairs. So once again, what do you do? When the worst thing happens, you turn back to God. Even if you're unhappy with God about it, (laughs) you turn back to God because he's the only one who can do anything about it. Now, let's finish up this chapter together. Verse 38, Elisha now returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in the land. One day, as a group of prophets were seated before him, he said to his servants, put a large pot on the fire and make some stew for the rest of the group. One of the young men went out into the field to gather herbs, and he came back with a pocket full of wild gourds. He shredded them and put them into the pot without realizing they were poisonous. Some of the stew was served to the men, but after they had eaten a bite or two, they cried out, Man of God, there is poison in this stew. So they would not eat it. And Elisha said, Bring me some some flour. And then he threw it into the pot and said, Now, it's all right, go ahead and eat it. And it did not harm them. One day, a man from Baha'u Shahalaha brought a man of God and a sack of fresh grain and 20 loaves of barley bread made from a first grain of the harvest. Elisha said, give it to the people so they can eat. What? The servant exclaimed. Feed hundreds of people with only this? But Elisha repeated, give it to the people so they can eat. For this is what the Lord says. Everyone will eat and there will even be some left over. When they gave it to the people, there was plenty for all of them and some left over, just as the Lord had promised. So, what do you do when the worst thing happens? Can you imagine feeding someone some food only to realize it's poisonous? What do you do? You come back to the Lord. What do you do when there's not enough food for everybody? What do you do? You come back to the Lord and watch what He will do. Now, as we get ready to finish our time together, I want to ask you a very serious question. Have you had something happen in your life that you would just consider to be the worst? Just just terrible, just horrible. It, it, I don't know what it was, and it didn't really matter what it was to me. What matters is what it did to you. And it just left you in this place. I don't really know how to move forward. That doesn't necessarily mean that it happened last weekend. I know people who have been stuck in, in their life and felt like they can't move forward for 10 years because something that was so terrible happened to them, and they just feel like they've been frozen for the past 10 years. Can I tell you that God sees that pain? God sees your hurt. God sees that not because you don't love him, but because you've been through so much pain that you've backed away from him. And can I tell you, that's understandable. However, the only one who can truly heal a broken heart is the Lord. There are things that you can do that can put a Band-Aid on it. There's things that can do that that can start the healing process. But the only one who can completely heal and make your heart whole is God. The Bible says in 1 Peter, I believe it's 5, 7, it says, cast all your worries and cares on him, for he cares about you. The Bible says that Jesus loved us so much, and he saw our suffering, and he was grieved about it so much. He wanted to deal with the sin issue in our life so that he came himself. Where is God in our suffering? 
He's right in the middle of it. He, the Bible says, was tested in every way. He suffered through everything we suffer through. So that now when we go to God, the Bible says we have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, who understands. He knows what it is to be betrayed. He knows what it is to lose someone close to him. He knows what it is to have people turn their back on him. In every point, he suffered, he struggled, he was sorrowful. And so when you come to God, and you don't even have the words to say, all you have are tears. All you have is pain. God doesn't look at you and say, get over it. He doesn't look at you with eyes that don't understand. But rather, he says, oh man, I know that feeling. I know what that's like. I got you. And he will carry you. And he will heal you. But you got to turn to him. Just like the lady who was afraid that someone was about to come take her boys. Just like the lady who lost her son. Just like the man who was panicked because he thought he was about to kill some people. Just like the people who had run out of their provision. When they turned to the Lord, God did something amazing. Whatever you need God to heal in your life, he is exceedingly and abundantly able to do more than we can ask, think, or imagine. If you'll turn to him today. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you that you are with us and you're for us. I pray you'll open our eyes to see that you are more with us than we can imagine. And it will cause us, Lord, to lean further into you, to let you to heal us from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And then, well, don't forget, there was a time in Elisha's life when he was surrounded by an enemy, and he and his assistant were terrified. But Elisha wasn't, and he said this. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17, Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. And the Bible said that the God opened the eyes of his assistant and he saw the armies of God surrounding his enemy. My prayer for you is that no matter how big the enemy of your life is, God will open your eyes to see that he is even bigger. I love you. I'll see you tomorrow for 2 Kings chapter 5.